Ready O Giggle Water and Quilt. You say? No Boulder Dash or Baloney here. Cheers, everyone, and welcome to the Unfiltered Gentlemen. No matter how you take your hooch, we've got something ice cold and on tap. Now, serving it to you straight and unfiltered, here are Craig, Scott, and Dan. Oh, yeah, that is right. Welcome in, everybody, to the Unfiltered Gentlemen. I am Greg. That is Scott. What's up? And that's Dan. That's right. Okay, maybe not. It's just me today. Good news, bad news. Whatever you think. Uh, cheers, everybody. Thanks for listening. Got a really cool show for you. The reason the other gentlemen are not here today, because I had a great opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with Laura Ulrich. She's the president of the Pink Boots Society. If you haven't heard about the Pink Boots Society, I will let her describe it much better than I ever could. But she's also the small batch brewer down at a little old brewery. Maybe you've heard of it. Let me know if you have. I believe they pronounce it Stone or maybe Stone A. Anyways, uh, they pop up in the news from time to time. So here's Laura uh, was nice enough to come on, answer some questions. Uh, one of the main topics we were talking about is March 8th is International Women's Day. And on the same day, they do uh, the Pink Boots Society Big Brew Day, uh, Big Boots Brew. So um, we wanted to talk about that. We wanted to talk about uh, her as a brewer and what got her into brewing. So uh, a lot of stuff to cover with Laura. I've been talking about it for a few weeks on the social medias. You know where to find us, Unfiltered Gentlemen, on uh, Facebook there, at Unfiltered Gents on Twitter, and, of course, the Unfiltered Gentlemen on Instagram. Talk about this for a few weeks on the social medias. Uh, so let's get right into it. We are being joined by not only the president of the Pink Boots Society, but also small batch brewer over at Stone Brewing down in Escondido, Laura Ulrich. In fact, am I even saying that right? Is it Ulrich or Ulrich? It's Ulrich. Oh, good. <laughs> all right. So you said it right. Fantastic. I, I've been thinking about it all day, and I, I forgot to even ask you. So perfect. I'm glad I said it you right. Know, I think people say it back and forth, and I don't even pay attention anymore. I, do, it's, I say it Ulrich. You could probably say Ulrich. I don't know. My, I probably have family members that say Ulrich. I don't know. I really know. <laughs> That's funny. Well, anyways, no matter how it's said, uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for taking some time out to hang out with me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. This is great. Absolutely. You know, I heard about the Pink Boot Society from uh, a brewer up here, uh, Tim from Tim Kazulis from Five Threads. I don't know if you know him. And I had never heard of Pink Boots, and I was interviewing him, and he said, you got to find the Pink Boots because they're actually really cool. And he told me a little bit about it. Found it, emailed you, uh, was very gracious enough to give me some time. So for those people who don't know what Pink Boot Society is, can you kind of give them the rundown? Yeah, so we are a women's professional organization for women in the brewing industry. So we are a nonprofit and we have members across the globe who sign up and we provide a social a aspect and then we also help with education. So advancing women's careers through uh, brewing and we offer scholarships and then other small things throughout the year. But our main focus is to educate and Im educate and advance women's careers in the brewing industry. Very nice. And what kind of um, scholarships do you hand out? We hand out uh, all different kinds, wide ranges. Uh, we offer about 12 a year, uh, if not more, depends on the year and what scholarships we have being listed for that year. Uh, we offer some Cicerone ones, so you just the basic intro to Cicerone. We also have a Siebel course for the online um, concise brewing course. Mm -hmm. We offer some Portland State University uh, scholarships. It's, we're wide range. We offer an SDSU one that focuses on distribution. So SDSU is here in San Diego. That's where I'm located. So um, we, there, we we cover the gamut. We offer a Fremont uh, up in Portland. I believe it's Portland. I think that's Portland or maybe it's Seattle. Hmm. We offer a scholarship for them. It's an actual internship. Okay. So we have a brewer that goes there and spends, I want to say, about six weeks with them and does a whole internship. So we hit the gamut. We hit from brewing side all the way down to distribution and all the way down to like just taste your own stuff. So anybody that's in the, you know, any woman that's in the brewing industry, we try and cover the, the spectrum as far as helping them advance their career. So and it's very cool because up until I'd say very recently, the, the whole brewing industry was very much and still kind of is a, a bit of a boys club. And, and so it seems like more and more women are, are starting to break in. And, and now more than ever, it seems like a very cool time to be a woman breaking into the quote unquote boys club. 
Yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, there, there's still that aspect. I think we try not to focus on it or even think about it. I think for me, I just like to watch and um, I, watch, I like to watch women that come into the industry and they get the first spark and they're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. And I want to be a part of it and then kind of help them take that to the next level and keep moving themselves forward uh, and getting, you know, more education and more knowledge. And that's kind of how it all started for myself was that when I was back in 2007, when I met Terry, um, I didn't know that other women had brewed. It wasn't that I, not that it was a big deal to me. I just didn't even think about it. And so when I met Terry, it was, the connection was made and it was nice to know that there are other women in the same industry and the same aspect that I could go reach out to and have a conversation with um, and just, you know, pick their brains and just get some information and, and kind of just make the connection. And so we've kind of grown from there. I know we try not to focus so much on like the male versus female section. It's, it's not about that. It's all about just kind of helping women advance their careers. That's what we're all about is just moving forward to the next step. Absolutely. When you when you talk about Terry, you're talking about Terry uh, Ferendorf, the the founder of Pink Boot Society. Correct. So she went on a uh, beer trip or beer tour where she was the road brewer and she was visiting all these breweries. And so she started to notice that there were a couple women in, at all these locations and that we didn't know of each other. And we, she thought, what a better way of making the connection was to have something like this Pink Boot Society. And so that we could, you know, communicate and that we could pass ideas and brainstorm and just reach out to for information and that's kind of how it all started and that's kind of where we're at today we're just taking it to the next level and blown up a little bit too um, just a little bit yeah yeah so going back to the beginning what what started you what what sparked your your craft beer cra- uh, passion well so I, I blame it all on my my older brother steve for getting me into beer i wasn't <laughs> much of a beer drinker um, i'm originally from st louis missouri and i wasn't much of a beer drinker um i had a couple beers during you know in high school did the thing but um sure. When I was in college, I didn't, like I said, I didn't really care for beer. But after I graduated college, I moved to Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, And he, my brother kept kind of offering me beers. And, you know, Newcastle was like my gateway beer. I know it sounds (laughs) awful, but, you know, thinking back to my day, I'm I'm rather old right now. Um, But when I got into the industry, like Newcastle was kind of the starting off point. And then I went to Fort Collins and there happened to be New Belgium Brewing Company. And there was Odell Brewing Company. And those guys, they, you know, they ran all the bars. And so you couldn't go to a bar and not have either a 90 shilling or an easy street wheat or a fat tire. Yeah, and so that's kind of how I got into beer was I was working at a punk rock bar. They'd come around and clean the beer lines. And I just thought it was super fascinating. They happened to have an opening on the bottling line um, about a year after I left the bar and I applied and I luckily got in. And so I started off at Odell Brewing Company on the bottling line. That's kind of how my whole beer inception worked. I don't think it was until I got to Stone after I left Odell because I was looking for um, looking for a chance to get outside of Colorado and move on. I don't think it was until I got to Stone to where I actually got the passion. I mean, it was one of those things where I think my interest really sparked when it came to IPAs, and I think it was sparked with like the equipment that they were using for you know filtering beer. Just I started questioning everything, so. That's kind of how I ended up where I'm at today. And I started off on the volley line at Stone and I worked my way up from the cellar and now I'm a small batch brewer. So I've kind of done it all. That's pretty incredible. I mean, it's, it's one of those real stories of people literally starting, you know, at the bottom and working their way up. Did you, yeah. did you have to go through like any sort of formal training or schooling to, to get to where you are now? Or is it just strictly working your way through? I, for me, I just strictly, I strictly, strictly <laughs> worked my way through, um, just working in the bottling line and then the cellar and then the brew house. I know that they had tried to put me on the brew house, but I was pretty adamant to know that I wanted to learn the cellar aspect before I got to the brewing side. Cause I thought that, you know, the brewers were like the coolest and they had the best job. So I wanted to make <laughs> sure I knew everything before I got to brewing. Now, now that I've been in the industry for quite a long time, I, I think that there's like a whole, I missed out on a whole aspect. I could have learned everything about brewing and then gone to the cellar and then done whatever. Um, I've taken the MBAA cl- course, the Master Brewers Association, the two week concise course. Um, and that's been super helpful. And then I've just learned, I've had some really great teachers in my life and that have uh, really put some amazing information into my head and just like taught me kind of the hands-on aspect of brewing and i really appreciate that very cool uh, 
I, I was doing some light stalking or research, as some people call it. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I, what I found, and you can confirm or deny, but I found out that you're responsible for a couple of really good beers, such as the, the smoked porter with vanilla bean and the southern chard. Is this true? Well, so I'm, so I'm responsible for the smoked porter with vanilla bean, the, the addition of the vanilla to uh, the wonderful stone smoked porter that we had. Um, that all kind of came out as a cast creation. There was... Before, when um, when the brewery first opened at the new location, it was all shiny, new, and fancy, and we were uh, just getting the bistro up and running, but it wasn't quite open, so they were holding like dinners on the inside in the brewery, so they were kind mm. of in the way, but not really, right. um, and they, they at one point had made a real beer float that I had never had, and I'm not a big dessert fan, so when it comes to desserts and pairings, I go, I have no idea, chocolate, um, <laughs> but so... I was offered, I had a little taste of a real beer float and it was real vanilla ice cream with stone smoked porter. And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. And then I went to Mitch Deal a couple of days later. I was like, we should make a cask of stone smoked porter with vanilla bean. And he was like all for it. And we made a couple. I did some trial and error as far as like the volume of how much vanilla to add, like what was enough for the beer and like some just bench trials. And we nailed it. And then the cask took off. Everybody was loving it. And they finally put it in a bottle and I was like, Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, so, when so, I read that, I got really excited because I went, Oh my God, I have a bottle of that in my fridge right now. That's, that's awesome. Oh, you shouldn't. That should be gone. <laughs> yeah. I think I got it. Uh, it's probably been there for about two months. It's, <laughs> well, it's, we haven't made it in a couple of years. So that's why it should be gone. We made the regular. We've now done, moved on to just this. It's just a porter mm-hmm. with vanilla. We removed the whole smoke aspect. Interesting. You know, that's interesting. I think I got this from Costco about two months ago, and it was in like a stone multi-pack at an insane good deal. And I thought, I, I can't not buy this. <laughs> so now I wonder why it was so well-priced. I don't know. You should drink it. Tell me what it's like. Let me know if it's bad. Well, there was four of them. I've, I've had the other three, and they're all fantastic. Well, great. <laughs> but this, the story for the Southern Chard is, so uh, because I'm small batch, we work with the barrels. And that's what we kind of work on. And I was the one that came up with the name. But it's not my, I wouldn't say that that's my creation. I'd, I'd say that's my whole collective team's creation. Anything that's barrel aged, I, I think our entire team deserves a credit. There shouldn't be any individual. But I did get to name it, which is cool. That is very cool. You know, I guess before we talked about this, I should have asked you to tell us what the small batch brewing is. You know, we all know about, you know, people that aren't in California very easily can get, uh, you know, Stone IPA and some of the essentials. But what does the small batch department do? So we are the small little offshoot of the regular production. So we do casks. We have a seven barrel pilot system. It used to be a 36 gallon more beer system, just three vessel. But now we have a, a seven barrel mark system that we use. Nice. And then we have nine fermenters. Um, and then on top of the pilot brewing the casts, and then occasionally a one-off, like um, a smaller batch of beer as far as like, so that say they have some IPA and we needed to make it a double dry hop, we'll work on that or a special creation. But then we also do all of the barrel aging. Oh, nice. So everything that's ever been put into a uh, 750 or a 500 mil has come from the team that I work with. And then all of the barrel aged stuff has been, I've been a part of, I was a first small batch brewer back in, I guess it's been, four years now um, before the the program started to really amp up. And I was like, Oh, I can't do this by myself. You got to get me some help. And so they started adding more and more people. So we're, we are, we have a manager and then we are a team of four. Very cool. Uh, Chelsea Renee over at the 21st amendment girls have a question. They want to know where do you get your inspiration for new beers when you're working? I think um, a lot of inspiration comes from like anything that we're either eating or if we've tasted something that we have like an idea, like, ah, so if we have like a new fruit or if we have like a fruit idea, that's like, oh, this would go really well with this barrel. Or if we just want to play around with some funky ingredients, or if there's something that's come around that we've never had, that's kind of our biggest inspiration is we walk, we talk it through, we offer suggestions, we bounce it back and forth to each other. Um, But I think for me, my, I'm kind of the, out of all of us, I'm kind of the classic one. I want things to be a little bit more simple and I want things to be really clean and I want to have that old classic flavor kind of come back. And so I'm always like, let's just add hops. Let's add classic, <laughs> you know, resin hops. And everyone's like, no, 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 let's add some special ingredients. And I'm like, no, let's just keep it simple. So 
I, that's no, kind of how that's how we work it out. I like that a lot. I, I just recently found out about um, not to talk about other brewers, but uh, Benchmark Brewing Matt down there in San Diego. Oh yeah, awesome stuff. I love his stuff, and I love his his slogan even more: beer flavored beer. Yes. Yeah, so that, do I. That was my my absolute favorite. Um, all right, and I I'm I'm not opposed to like the you know adding the fruit and all the funky stuff. I think for me, like I I really like I want I like the simplicity of everything. I like the simplicity of how brewing can be, and I know that there's a way that you can make it more extravagant and crazy. And, and I'm I think that there is there is some amazing amazing breweries out there that are totally doing that, and that they're just crushing it. So I you know I don't, I don't want to compete with that, or I don't need to compete. I'm just I appreciate when people do that. I, that's just not, that's not how I like to operate. Absolutely. I like it. What's uh what's a very rewarding part of your job? Oh, excuse me. As I was taking a drink. Um, oh, sorry. Too quick of a question. No, no, no. It's all right. Um, I think the most rewarding part for me is, is um, kind of similar with pink boots. It's, it's getting to know the team and then watching them all grow and watching them all learn like the processes at stone. I mean, we're a big brewery. So, we do things on a repetition status and you know, when guys come in or women come in, anybody comes in, they learn things and they, you've know, got these big eyes and they're like all excited. And it's just like, it's like, all right, this is production. Get ready to like really kind of hunker down and, and do the same thing. So I think I appreciate watching people grow and we have a great team. We've had a lot of people come and go from stone and I just appreciate everybody that I've had a, a, a chance to like connect with. And we have some pretty awesome people that we currently work with and then some awesome people that have left and they're doing amazing things. So I think that the best thing so far for me has been just working with everybody. I learned from them. I hope they learn from me and that's, it's pretty rad. Absolutely. You know, it seems like as I've gotten more and more into this and I've, I've, you know, got to meet some really cool brewers. The big thing is they, they all like each other. It's not this huge, like we hate the people that have left and gone out into other breweries or anything like that. It's all like a big team of craft beer people against the yellow fizzy water. Yeah, I think it's just, a, it's all about community, right? We're we're here to like not make it, um, there's there's a little bit of competition because I kind of think that, that keeps everything very fresh and kind of moving forward. Sure. But like, we're all about community and we're all about working together as opposed to, because it, it takes a village, right, to, to do anything. So why why fight the fight each other whenever you can just kind of move forward and just like work with each other to get stuff done? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a healthy competition. With no competition, you guys would get stale, but uh, yeah. a, a fair amount of friendly uh, competition. Things get better, oh. things get done, and, and it's a good thing. Absolutely. that's how I think that's how the whole fruit thing happened. I'm, I, I swear, it had to have come that way. <laughs> um, have you done any, um, you know, like really cool collaborations with, you know, you as a stone brewer and other breweries? I have done, actually, um, that's, prob- that's another one of my favorite things that I don't get to do often enough. Um, my very first uh, collaboration that I really got to participate in on my own, like as a stone representative, was I brewed, oh, this is like in 2013, I can't even remember the year, um, maybe it was longer than that. It was with Megan Parisi of Cambridge Brewing Company, when she, Cambridge Brewing Company when she was working with them, and then Whitney Thompson, who happened to be at the time working for Victory, and I flew out to Boston and we did the first ever female collaboration. It was awesome. We used Saffron. We had flowers on our brew house. We just <laughs> totally took it to the nines. Um, so that was, I've done that. I've done several brews just with Chris Ketchum down at Liberty Station. And I've done, obviously, the handful of brews for Big Boots Brew for Pink Boots Society. I don't think I have like a particular one that I love more than other, other than probably my first one that I did with the, the women in Cambridge. Um, I think brewing with other people's pretty awesome because you get to learn new techniques you get to be a witness to watching other people do a process and then there's that whole collaboration portion that goes into it like talking about the recipe and and asking questions on how like they operate their brewery or what they do for their brews or how they function in the cellar Uh, like I said you learn something every time you work with somebody else in that spectrum and I think that collaborations do a really healthy job of like transfer of information i think people learn stuff from each other Mm -hmm. and then i think you also get to teach somebody something that maybe they weren't aware of or a new technique that they just don't do so in the past several years um this will be the second year uh that i didn't participate with the women here in san diego as far as i kind of had a crew of women devin randall who who's now working with uh arts district and then kim lutz who was with um St. Archer, 
mm-hmm. who's now with Maui. So this will be the, the second year in a row that for my, my the women's collaboration, the Big Boots Brew for Pink Boots Society, I won't have them around. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, you know, you talk about the, the trading of knowledge and stuff. Just, I, I've very, very recently started home brewing. And just talking to other people who do it, all of a sudden they just they want to give me stuff like, oh, here's my my wart chiller. I hear you need one, or <laughs> or here's this, you know, like oh, don't mess around with those stupid carboy caps. Get a get a uh, or a bungs. Get a get a cap. It'll save you so much grief and all this. And it, it's so cool. Like it, it's such a fun community to be around and to be a part of because they are so uh, not selfish and not like oh, you know, don't look at how I'm brewing my beer. Right. It, yeah, it, was, I- it was very surprising. Yeah, and professional brewers do that too. Like, we'll, we'll like I said, we'll we'll sh- share secrets. You know, we'll you know we'll converge on like uh, recipes and we'll talk about stuff. And you know, I think any time that we've ever Stones ever need anything, I think we've been able to reach out to the local community and, and have it. I know once we needed rice holes, we were able to like go pick some up. So, and we've got hops. So I think people contact us for hops. So it's it's all about community and it's all about collectively sharing information and just being being part of the part of the whole greater good of, of making better beer. That's very cool. Um, Casey wants to know, what advice would you have to uh, women in particular that are trying to get into brewing on a professional level? Uh, so I think the, the t- times have changed from, it's a little different from when I got into it. Um, I think having the, the, the schooling and having one of the, there's so many schools out there now, there's so many pro- brewing programs that you can either do online there's a lot of them that are locally, depending on where Casey's at, uh, you can get locally. I think having that, having the theory and the the more technical knowledge of brewing is a good thing to have behind you. And then being able to find a place that's willing to allow you to either work your way up or allow you to volunteer to kind of get an idea of what the flow is on the floor um, is probably the best way. I think starting off in packaging is probably one of the amazing ways to go because Hmm. the packaging you're the last person to touch the beer so ultimately i know that they don't think that they're the most important people but they happen to be the most important people in brewing because they're the last ones to give the beer to the public so it's ultimately up to them to make it amazing so i think if you can just get into a spot have a little bit have some of that knowledge have some of that education underneath your belt i think it'll look really good on a resume and then reaching out to local community and just finding out how other brewers are making their way and their connection into the industry. I like it. Um, going back to the uh, Pink Boots Society, so we talked about the scholarships and some of those sort of things. What other activities do the you know there's different chapters in every kind of area. What sort of activities do the different chapters put on as part of the Pink Boots Society? So every chapter is different, obviously. Some chapters meet more frequently than others. So, for example, San Diego happens to be the biggest, and then we also meet the most frequently. So we meet uh, every month except for December. So we meet 11 mm-hmm. times a year, and every month is a totally different meeting. It, um, For example, we have one coming up where we're going to be meeting at a location, and they're going to teach us all about personal financing and things oh. that we can and cannot write off. Like it, it's like just we happen to have a couple of accountants that work for breweries, and they're going to offer up their time and offer up their knowledge. I, I think it's super fantastic. Uh, previous to that, we met at Benchmark, and we nice. talked about how a handful of us happen to be JBF judges, and a couple of them are BJCP judges, and we talked about our experience and how we got into judging. And then how other women can also partake. So That's we're doing everything we can to like pass the knowledge that we all have onto each other to kind of just make everybody better. That's really cool. And and please help me out here if you can. Matt's wife down at Benchmark. I cannot think of her name. Rachel. Thank you. Uh, I, I did their class that they offered at the very end of December, beginning of January, where it was they were teaching us how to judge beer because they're both you know certified. Yes. And she's great. I mean, not to be uh, anything against Matt, but she was much better at describing a lot of things than he was. And it was a whole lot of fun. Well, good. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Rachel will love to hear that. She'll be proud. <laughs> yes. And, but Matt was great at uh, passing the beer around. So it was good. Um, <laughs> as the president of the Pink Boots Society, what is, what is your role? My role. So 
My role is pretty much to kind of make sure everything is going. Uh, you know, we are a nonprofit. We have a part-time em- paid employee who it works her freaking tail off to make everything kind of happen behind the scenes. And then I happen to have some wonderful, I have currently eight wonderful board members, and we all have a role and we all have tasks. And so my I'm, I'm kind of overseeing and making sure that like everybody's kind of focused and taking care of their little tasks. But my main thing, I think, is to just kind of make sure that the movement of Pink Boots is happening in the positive direction moving forward. I, you know, I was lucky enough. Terry's been working. Terry had worked her, her butt off to make Pink Boots get to the beast, this amazing thing that it's at right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was her for the longest time, and she would just kind of get volunteers here and there, here and there, here and there. And then she eventually got Emily Ingdahl, who is our executive director, uh, just a couple of years back. So it was ultimately just Terry and Emily that were just pushing through and doing everything and recruiting volunteers. And then it wasn't up until just this pat not this, I guess it's been, it'll be a year in March that they, Terry needed a break. She had a new job. She wanted to focus back on her husband and just take a little time away from pink boots. And it, I, they just put me on the board and they're just like, you know, you seem like the most logical sense. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take the challenge. And it's been, it's been extremely rewarding. I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about pink boots and I've learned a lot about how to manage a business, even though this is a nonprofit, just kind of keeping the progress moving forward and building the framework to keep pink boots, taking it to the next level is ultimately what my goal is. I want, I want us to be sustainable and I want us to be around for a very, very long time. So Anything I can do to help build that, I'm all about. I like it. Um, March 8th, which is kind of the reason I reached out for this interview, is International Women's Day, and it's also uh, the Big Boots Brew. What is the Big Boots Brew? So uh, we started this, I guess this is the fourth year. Um, This happens on March 8th, International Women's Day. This was started by an idea from Sophie. Please forgive me. I forget her last name at the moment. Um, she came up with an idea to Terry about ha- having women collectively get together on this day and brew a beer. And it turned into our biggest fundraiser. So it kind of spawned off into one thing. And now it turns into our biggest fundraiser for scholarships. We're at March, 7, uh, March 8th, 2017. And we're going to be doing a historical beer. This is to help celebrate the women that had gone on our Germany tour, which is our second Germany tour that we've done. Okay. And it's just a day for women to get together and to brew. And um, we know that March 8th, because it happens to fall during the week, is not always going to be the day that people brew. So it's anything open during that around that time, just as long as you're brewing, getting together, collaborating, um, learning, and teaching each other about the process and just having a really good time and building that camaraderie. So you talked about losing some of your uh, collaboration partners. Will you be collaborating with anybody else this year? I actually, I am. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to, this is probably the busiest I've ever been. Um, I have found, I've been lucky enough to find places to go uh, the last several years. Um, last year I was in Arizona and then the year prior to that I was, oh my God, I'm blanking. <laughs> um, I think it was at Monkey Paw. Sorry. Oh, nice. Um, Just try so I, yeah. Their monkey paw is amazing. So good. Uh, so good. Yeah. I mean, we're pretty lucky here in San Diego. We have a lot of really good beer. Um, but so this year I'm actually going to be partaking in second chance. They're going to, they're going to do a brew on a Saturday and then I'm going to go over to fall brewing and I'm going to brew with them on their system. And then March 8th, the actual day of brewing, I'm going to go hopefully up to LA and brew with Alex at three weavers. She's okay. trying to get a whole, um, LA chapter, San Diego chapter, like an entire like large group of women up in her brew house, make it a mess. I can't wait. And then <laughs> there's Carly Smith, who is the head brewer over at Rock Bottom La Jolla. And so I'm going to go there and I'll end my, my whole brewing extravaganza with her on that following the 11th, that following Saturday. So I have a lot of brewing to go on. That, that's it's a fun. busy week. It is. But so it's also fun. I like to get with other, like I said, like telling you about telling you, I like to get with other people and like learn and talk to them about what's going on and where they're at and where they need to go and what they want to see and how they want to advance. And I, I find that whole aspect like amazing. And then I like to, 
you know, I like to get in there and I like to be able to help out and I like to be able to step aside and watch other people do it. it it's, it's really fascinating. It's a lot of fun to be a part of. Yeah. So I guess the important question is, are we able to find this beer that everyone's collaborating on? Absolutely. So some of them are going to be, I'm sure some of them are going to be smaller scale. So like five gallons or a smaller pilot system. Mm -hmm. Um, Others are going to be on large scale. Now, I don't know about as far as like national distribution, but I think it all, you know, I think you'll be able to find it at your local pub. Hopefully they've had a brewer or an area of breweries that have brewed and that they're uh, selling their beer there. Ultimately, that helps that helps us because that's what that's how we make our money. Like we need that. We need that dollar. <laughs> make that paper. Um, yeah, make that paper. <laughs> what What is the uh, the historical beard? Tell us more about that. So, uh, so it was an idea that came up. Emily was the one that suggested it to kind of tie in. We've been participating in this cultural immersion tour for uh, the last two years, where. We get with uh, we team up with tours of tre- treasures of Germany, and we go over to Germany and we spend a, a week plus over there with him, and we learn all about the German brewers, and we go to all these breweries and learn all about the German culture. That Emily had thought this year would be a good historical aspect, and that w- would allow people to go and research a beer. And if people didn't want to do the the historical side of it, they could take an ingredient that was used like honey or molasses and incorporate that into their brew. So a lot of people Mm. are doing porters and a lot of people are doing stouts. And then the wonderful people over at Avery had come up with this amazing recipe that we shared on our website that you can go in and you can download. And that could be like your base beer. And then there's another, um, another lovely lady on the East coast who offered up a historical recipe for us to use and it's been just ancient and historical it's, it's great um amy noel large from avery is the one that provided the recipe and it, it sounds great it's going to have honey in it and it's going to be just going to be amazing and if you had any avery brew you, you know it's not going to be wrong at all no not at all they do a really good job they do, they do a fantastic job um how can non-brewers get involved with uh, the event so uh, there's a, we have a handful of uh, little home brewers, not little home brewers. I shouldn't say that. We we're calling <laughs> it Little Boots Brew. So home brewers can get get together and they can also participate in this event. Um, you can find all this information on our website. You can even go to it's just under pinkbootsociety.org, Big Boots Brew, and we have like a whole map of places that are brewing that are listed, and then it just tells you all the information that you need. How do you register? who can register um, and the further details and then some suggestions on the recipe. Very cool. Um, Erica wants to know what is a big misconception about women in the craft beer industry? Oh, I have no idea. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's fine too. A misconception. I don't, um, I don't know. I, I don't know. That's not a bad answer. I mean, uh, you know, I guess you could say like, oh, you know, there's there's not enough women or, or women don't, uh, you know, brew or something like that. But uh, if there's not a misconception, then that's even better. I mean, I, I don't th- – are there not enough women? No. I mean, I don't think there's enough women, but, I, I mean, there's not enough women in a lot of things. So Very true. I, I, don't, I don't know that that's a misconception. I, when I think of a misconception, I would assume that people would think that we couldn't do the job, and that's not true. I guess yeah. if people think that, but I hope people don't think that because women are pretty amazing and they're really good at a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things. Yeah. And, and I think people, if, if there were people that actually felt that way, they'd be very surprised to look up their brewer and find out who's brewing their beer. I think I, find, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. I think they'd find a lot of women are, are making the beer they're drinking right now. Um, and if they're, if they're not making it, they're, you know, they're running the cellars and making sure that the beer is super clean they're packaging the beer. There's there are women in all aspects, not just in brewing. So, I think people would be pretty shocked to know that there there's not enough of us. But I there I think that we're building that, and eventually we won't ever have this conversation about women in, versus men in brewing. Absolutely. Um, I want to know: Do you homebrew at all? No, I don't. You want to know why? Because I work. <laughs> just leave it all at work. I leave it all at work. <laughs> I also uh, I. Up until just a couple of years ago, I lived in a tiny apartment that didn't have any space to brew. And I have cats, and so there would be hair everywhere. 
Oh. Um, but for me, it's like I like to be able to go to work, make a giant mess, and then have these hoses to clean it up. <laughs> that must be nice. And then kind of leave it and then walk away. Um, I was never into home brewing. I, it sounds like a really weird thing. When I was at Odell, uh, my brother was a home brewer, and so I was like buying him books for Christmas and like going here, here's a home brewing book. <laughs> it's it sounds like I, I it's like a very weird weird thing. Like I know I should be home brewing, but I, I like to do it at work. I feel like you do more than homebrew. You you brew for everyone else to enjoy. So that's that's way more important. So it's okay. Good. I'm glad. I'm yeah. glad people think that. Yeah. Scott wants to know, do you get to taste at work? Yes. I have to. Um, some, days are, some days are not nearly as fun as others. I know people think that tasting on the job would be so fantastic. And let me tell you, there are days where I'm just like, why don't you come taste 35 barrels? Like, I don't want to taste through these. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so when we, for barrel aged beers, we taste through every single, we do every single barrel and then we run a pH on it and that will be, we're the ultimate ones. Our flavor, our palate are ultimately the ones that tell whether it's going to go into the blend or not. Um, you, you know, you're the last resort, like you can do everything you want as far as making everything clean, but if it doesn't taste right to you, then there's no point, point in putting it in a blend specifically for barrels. Um, and then also whenever we package beer, we always have to taste it to make sure it's taste approved. Makes so, sense. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, 21st Amendment Girls want to know, what would you suggest for women who do not work in the beer industry but would like to support Pink Boot Society? Um, I would say join one of these, uh, the Little Brutes, Little Boots Brew Days. Or if you can just, anything that you can do, if you see that there is a chapter event happening in San Francisco or in your town, I know that there's a lot of uh, San Francisco has a huge chapter up there and they do a lot of fun events. So I think if women who are just interested in, in hanging out and having beers and just walking up to a pink booter and just talking to them, I think that's a great way to support us. Very cool. And they also want to know, have you found as a woman involved with beer that you often have to defend your knowledge and understanding of craft beer or has it gotten better over the years? It's definitely gotten better over the years. Um, I definitely think when I started off, um, I had to defend myself. I don't have to do that anymore, but I, I also have to just defend myself because I'm kind of a feisty woman to begin <laughs> with. So I'm just defending and I'm defensive. No, um, <laughs> I, I think that I think it's definitely gotten better. Um, there are definitely times that I still hear stories of women who have to point out that they're the brewer or that, you know, the guy that they're next to is not the, only the brewer is not the brewer. They themselves are the brewer. So right. I think there's some times that you kind of have to, you know, stand a little tall and puff your shoulders up a little bit and be like, Hey, I know what's going on. It's getting <laughs> better though. It's gotten better. That's good. Um, last question. And this is, this is just fanboy me asking. I, uh, I picked up two brand new beers. One is the, uh, give me IPA or give me death. And as well as the tangerine express IPA, did you have your hand in any of those? Tangerine Express, um, the Give Me Death, the Give Me IP or Give Me Death, that's all Richmond, Virginia. That's all they're doing. They oh, did a nice. fantastic job on it, but that's the Richmond Stone Brewing. That team nailed it. Uh, the Tangerine Express, the only thing I had to do with it really was um, when Steve came to us, Steve, my manager, we had uh, to make a special creation. We had to put it together in a small tank for a distributor and it just happened to be so amazing that they decided to make it bigger and better and i believe we did it a couple times on the pilot system but now now i personally don't have to do with it it's all the big brew guys they get to take care of that stuff gotcha just had to ask just had to ask so. yeah just the original stuff have you so have you had the tangerine express i have it's very good it's a lot of fun to drink that beer and it's a lot it's really good for for pairing with like seafood and like citrusy stuff it's pretty rad yeah I, I i just had it very recently and as we talk right now i'm having the give me ipa or give me death um i was very pleasantly surprised at tangerine because i was afraid it was gonna be fruity and as we we're talking yeah. about earlier it's like we like you know beer flavored beer and it and it wasn't super fruity just had a little bit of fruit notes to it yeah and so that you're referring to the give me ipa or give me death the i'm sorry the tangerine Okay, the t have you, so what did you think of the, the Give Me IPA or Give Me Death? I'm drinking it right now, and I really like it. 
Okay, I like that beer a lot. I thought that was really cool. I looked at it. I was like, this is not an IPA. Like, this, what's wrong with the color? And then <laughs> I was like, oh, sh- this is really good. Like, I think the, the, Richmond, the Richmond Brewers did a really good job with that. Yeah, it has almost like a brown ale color to it. And yeah, you're like, this is not an IPA. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I didn't buy it at first when I saw it because it said brewed with raspberries and blackberries, and I don't like raspberries. And I talked to somebody else who said they really liked it. It's like, all right, fine, I got to try it. And Super it's really subtle. good. Yeah. Very subtle. Good job to uh, to Richmond for this one. This is fantastic. Yep, they did a really good job. I'm proud of those guys out there. Yeah, it's very good. If you guys would like to find out more about the March 8th Big Boots Brew, go over to pinkbootssociety.org. You can find Pink Boots on Twitter at Pink Boots Beer. You can find Laura on Twitter on uh, or Instagram at Pink Booter. And uh, get involved, find something in your area. And uh, if you can, if nothing else, give a little donation uh, Laura, thank you so much for, for hanging out, for, for talking to us, for spending the time. No, thank you guys for having me. This is great. Thank you so much once again to Laura. That was a lot of fun. I, I kind of nerded out a little bit there. She was great to talk to. It was fun talking Stone. It was fun talking Pink Boot Society. It was uh, it was just good all around. I hope she comes back and talks just about anything she wants to someday, whether it's Stone, Pink Boots, or anything else. Uh, like I said in the interview, if you want to find more about her, at Pink Booter on Instagram and Twitter, and uh, pinkbootssociety.org is where you find more about Pink Boots Society. Also, at Pink Boots Beer on Twitter. Um, you can go to the website for the recipe for the Big Brew Day, uh, Big Boots Brew, and all that good stuff, and to uh, find ways to donate and everything else. So thank you guys for listening. You know you can find us at theunfilteredgentleman.com on Facebook, Unfiltered Gentleman, on Twitter, at Unfiltered Gents, on Instagram, The Unfiltered Gentleman. Don't forget uh, our phone number, 805-538-BEER. That's easy. Call us and leave us a drunk message or something. So thanks to Laura. Thanks to you guys for listening. Let her know you heard her on the show. And on that note, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.